Hi, good evening, everyone. You'll be happy to know this is the last talk, I believe. Um, I'm not going to talk, I'm Michael Schwartz from Pasadena, California, home of the Rose Parade, Rose Bowl, you know, all that. Um, I'm not going to talk about my technique tonight. I'm going to talk about, uh, this is a personal experience with blood loss and large volume liposuction. We've all been talking about large volume liposuction and there are uh, hemodynamic changes. I have no disclosures. And so the, uh, treating uh, patients with lipedema is a balancing act. This surgery is staged surgery. Everyone's having, or most people are having multiple surgeries and we want to get as much done in each surgery, but we want to ensure the safety of the patient too. So we have to keep that in mind. Um, there is significant volume loss, as everyone said, uh, fat and some blood. We'll find out um, whether we're dealing with more advanced stage patients, intermediate stages, even stage one patients uh, do experience some blood loss. Here's some examples. Another example, even in arms, there's less blood loss, I believe, in arms and in extremities. Uh, this is after uh, liposuction and brachioplasty, another liposuction and brachioplasty. This is stage liposuction of the legs. So this is a typical case. Uh, others have showed this also. This is a typical volume that we might remove in one surgery, and you see the fat and the infernate and blood tinged anesthetic solution. It looks like there's no blood there, I mean, or very little blood. However, the epinephrine, and this is another case, an example, the epinephrine in the tumescent solution wears off, and there is some oozing into the uh, absorbent pads, and I believe there's some blood loss over the next few days that we may not be aware of. And so our usual plan with people is we treat the anterior and posterior legs separately. I like to do that. I think uh, doing that preserves the venous and lymphatic outflow of the part that we're not doing. In the past, I treated legs circumferentially, and I think people stayed swollen for longer. It took, in fact, months for the edema to subside, and I think this is uh, more efficacious. Again, that's, this is my personal opinion. Um, we'll treat the anterior legs, posterior legs, and we separate these surgeries by usually eight weeks at a minimum. It gives the patient time to recover, both in terms of anemia, if there is any, and just in terms of feeling like they can come back and do it again. So we might treat the back flanks and abdomen with or without abdominoplasty, and the arms with or without brachioplasty. In my uh, experience, I like to treat the skin removal in the legs after two separate days of liposuction. I like to let people heal for six to 12 months see how much skin contraction occurs, and then assess the legs for uh, skin removal. I know it's, uh, with all due respect to Dr. Chen, who's d doing very excellent work immediately. Um, I feel like if I'm going to treat a large leg and uh, to mess it, and it further increases the size of the leg, and then suction it, there's still gonna be some edema. You have to get that leg closed at that time. And I feel like in my hands it may be undercorrected as compared to delaying it and staging it. In smaller patients, we might treat the anterior, upper, and lower legs first, and then include the arms with the posterior legs, and then the back flanks and abdomen. And so, in the interest of patient safety, and uh, since I just didn't have this information, um, we decided to check patient's hemoglobin on the day of surgery in addition to their pre-op labs, and then on the day after surgery. And we used to use the device called the HemaQ, which required a finger stick, which was not pleasant at all. Um, it's not terrible, but nobody likes to get their fingers stuck. And so this device is made by Massimo. It's a non-invasive uh, device, and the top number, the 13.4, is hemoglobin. The next number, the 97, is oxygen saturation, and then the pulse is 74. And so with this, we're able to non-invasively check hemoglobin on the day of surgery the next day, and then we rarely see people for multiple days, but it would be useful, I think, to be able to check somebody's daily hemoglobin for up to two weeks, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Um, and so the other parameters we're looking at are total volume of aspirate, fat volume of aspirate, the estimated blood loss that the surgeon estimates during every surgery, the IV fluid volume administered by the anesthesiologist, we do these under IV sedation or general since patients are unconscious. Um, the tumescent fluid volume, the BMI, and then again the hemoglobin. 
And so uh, we're just starting to look at this statistically and evaluate it. So this is just averages that I'm going to present to you today. Um, the average BMI is 33. The average volume of fat removed has been 5.8 liters. The average estimated blood loss, 165 cc's. And the average decrease in hemoglobin is 2.5 with a range of 0.1 to 6.6. .6. And just an observational uh, thing that I've, that I've noted, which is not uh, scientifically uh, been shown yet, is that I believe the larger uh, patients with more advanced stages actually lose less blood than smaller patients, uh, even despite the larger volumes. However, um, Dr. Herbst is helping me with this study as well. She did preliminary um, statistical analysis of this and felt that the decrease in hemoglobin was directly related to the volume, which makes more sense. So we're probably going to find that out. Complications, important to mention. We've had some minor complications, just a few seromas, which is a fluid collection that can be easily aspirated. Um, we had one patient develop an infection. She had chronic diarrhea. She could not take antibiotics. She refused to remove her garment, and the combination of that with diarrhea and no showering, she got a small infection in her lower back and the sacral area, which resolved with antibiotics. We have had, uh, in, a, in a series of 450 patients, uh, two developed deep vein thrombosis in the legs. That's really serious, as you all probably know. And three patients required transfusion. Um, since that time, which has been 14 months now since anyone's required transfusion, we've increased the amount of tumescent fluid, and I think that has a direct bearing on blood loss in a positive way. And so typically now I'll use four liters of tumescent fluid in each anterior leg, four liters in each posterior leg, four liters in a back and flank, four liters in an abdomen. Um, and we also, in view of the DVT risk, now anticoagulate everybody. We've been doing this for quite some time. So on the night of surgery, we give everyone an injection of Lovenox that they self-administer or their caretaker administers. And then we put them on low dose Eliquis, which is a blood thinner, uh, just a small twice a day dose for the next 10 days. We encourage ambulation on the day of surgery, make sure nobody's just laying in bed, and people are also wearing compression, which helps, obviously. And so here are some examples. Um, this is a woman who had staged anterior legs followed by posterior legs, and then this is one week following a thighplasty. I like to use a vertical thighplasty with a line on the inside back of the leg with a small J that comes around into the inguinal area or groin in front. This is a patient who had multiple surgeries with us. We treated her anterior legs, her posterior legs. She had thighplasty and a fleur de abdominoplasty, all on different days. Here's another example of a fleur de abdominoplasty, which includes the vertical resection. And uh, this is my contact information and my coordinator in right and left hand, Christina. And feel free to reach out to us with any questions. And I thank you. And my newest grandson, James, thanks you as well. He'll be three months old uh, this month. Thank you very much. <laughs>